for joining us today. We're just letting people into the room. It is uh, 10.01 here in Southern California. It is 1 p.m. on the East Coast, 8 p.m. in Israel. And uh, we welcome you to this uh, special CSP online event. Uh, we titled this On the Ground in Israel um, with uh, Israeli-based CSP presenters. I've been getting lots of emails from many of you asking um, how are people, I mean, obviously very aware of what's going on in the news, but asking in particular, how are our CSP presenters doing? How are they personally doing? How are their families doing? What's going on? Um, and then I got uh, quite a few emails and calls from Shirel, um, very much distraught about what's going on and, and trying to figure out, uh, figure out a way how we can help. So um, we came up with the idea of doing this program so you can hear from some of our people on the ground in Israel. And also, we're going to give you some ideas of how you can help. I do want to thank the Jewish Community Foundation of Orange County and Wendy Aronson, who is the executive director of the um, Jewish Community Foundation, for co-sponsoring today's program. Uh, I'm going to let uh, I'm going to ask Wendy to say a few words as well, and then Shirel is going to take over moderating. And I think you'll see some familiar CSP people here. I can see Gila Levitan. Hi, Gila. Um, some of these people you all know. Some of some of them you some uh, some of them only people know who went on trips to Israel. But I think you'll find everybody's input very valuable today. So with that, Wendy, I wanted to give you an opportunity to, to uh, greet the CSP crowd and uh, Federation uh, Foundation crowd. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to say how important this is today that we're hearing from people directly in Israel. Um, in addition to all the news that we see, to to understand the experiences going on and, and how they are feeling and doing is so imperative, as we all know. So we're just honored to be a part of this and to help with anything that you need um, in terms of helping to facilitate giving to Israel. Um, just know we're here for you. Hey, so um, hello, everyone. Um, and thank you very much. This uh, might be the longest um, speaking period I've had in four days because mostly um, I find myself texting uh, rather than talking. Um, and I wanna say how much I first of all appreciate that you're here uh, and that it's really meaningful. Uh, and we have here quite a few uh, CSP friends, uh, Paul Litz, Nachliel Sullivan, Tomer Persico, Gila Levitan, Evgenia Kempinski. I don't know if David Mendelssohn is online yet or not. We'll find him. Um, he just relocated with his family to Netanya. They're safe, but internet is uh, not stable. Uh, and we have a few other people that are part of this community. They're all safe. They couldn't make it to this call, um, but just so you know that they're all safe. Um, as Ari mentioned, and I think much like everyone in Israel in the last uh, days, um, um, I am at loss for words. Um, so I'm very also grateful for the people here that are willing to find the words and share them. And But what I did find myself doing, like everyone is volunteering and donating wherever I can. Uh, but I also realized there's no opportunity for people from the US to um, donate directly to families from the kibbutzim around the Gaza border. Uh, so I've been working with a lot of amazing people here in Israel, volunteering and with the backing of both Ari and uh, Wendy to create a donation line that allows US uh, citizens to do so tax deductible, easy to do, knowing that the funds will go fully to the families that need this. So at the end of this 45 minutes program, I will share the link. Uh, I'll explain how it works. We'll also send out a newsletter so you have all the information. I do, it's important to say any way you've, you've donated and want to donate or volunteer or give is valid. This is not to say any of the other organizations are less Absolutely not. Um, this is another opportunity. And for those that feel that this is the way they want to give, um, I, I feel it's important to allow it. Um, um, this isn't a news update uh, and not a manifest. We, 
we're asking each of the people speaking to speak from their own experience, uh, share a little of how they're doing, what they've been doing, where are their thoughts at, um, just to come together and hear a little bit that isn't the news flash and kind of those big statements, but rather share uh, from our own experiences. So we'll each talk for just a few minutes to keep this within our time frame, and uh, I'll say that the chat is open for host and co-hosts. You're more than welcome to put your questions and comments in the chat. Wendy, Wendy will be moderating the chat so that there's a, if there's something crucial, she can interrupt us. Um, and uh, Paul, I'll unmute you and if you can say a few words. Hi, it's, it's good to be here again. I was with you personally a few years ago um, this is a very strange period uh, for me and our, myself. From the 1980s, um, because we have uh, four children who all served in the army, and I was in the army and the reserves for an extended period of time, until now, um, the wars and the conflict have always been very much a family affair. We were always worrying about one or other of the members. Uh, the years have gone by, and now of our um, grandchildren, the two oldest women uh, who did their army service are not being called up, but we have a granddaughter who's in the southern part of the country who is training soldiers and officers to uh, fight um, um, shoulder missiles. Um, it's a very complex technical kind of realm. So in, in a sense, um, we only have one person who we directly worried about in terms of the army, but the family is clearly very, very much affected. Um, we have a, a son and a daughter-in-law with a two-year-old child who is staying with us, who can't get back home to San Francisco. And uh, the two-year-old uh, finds himself not with us because we don't, we haven't had any attacks. We're uh, 20 minutes north of Tel Aviv, and it's been a, a safe area. Sh Shamron area is safe, but uh, they spend some time with other members of the family, and this little kid, two-year-old kid, finds himself every few hours in a bomb shelter. And um, this, I think, is really the important part. The, the gap in how I'm feeling and how someone's feeling 20 minutes drive from here is unbelievable. You, one doesn't know how to even explain to one part of the family or the friends who have been in bomb shelters again and again in the last few days. And we are here uh, in this part of the country where things are, are safe. Um, we, if I can ask myself what I'm feeling, it's uh, a whole range, and um, the days and nights take on a different picture. Um, when I'm uh, not looking at the television or writing, and I, I've had so many requests from people asking me to explain what's going on, the writing, by the way, has been very good for me because I'm active. And at the moment that I'm not active, it's very difficult for me. And, and in the previous wars and conflicts, I was in a, a unit going out to speak to soldiers and officers around the country, explaining what was happening. So there's a sense of loneliness. Um, we, I can't just go over to a friend and have a, a, a cup of coffee with them because we're frightened of the, of the alarms going off. The area that we're living in, a small town called Evan Yehuda, 14,000 citizens, the interesting part about where we're living is it's a, a comfortable middle class area, a lot of high tech people, and the level of volunteering is amazing. They, they I, I wanted to do some volunteering, yeah, and they said, we've got enough people. We, it, it's in, and that's the very much the sense of, uh, of what's going on. Um, the the issue i think is how we all get involved in this what we what we try and do so personally as i mentioned i'm trying to explain to people overseas what's happening 
And I know it's very confusing. We've got a, a nephew in South Africa. South Africa media is very, very anti-Israeli. So I'm trying to explain to him, and he's very involved in Israel. He would spend time here trying to explain to these people what's going on and it changes so quickly. So if the news is changing so quickly, my feelings are changing quickly. A, a little while ago, I'm not trying to do an update, there was some reports of things going on in Haifa and one immediately finds oneself sort of trying to get into the minds and the feelings of uh, uh, different people. Um, my, my helping at the moment, to be honest, is uh, essentially to make myself available for people who want me to deal with certain issues. And because I, I managed to move out of my emotional self to my academic self, it kind of makes it easier. But I'm hiding things. And I'm very aware of that. I'm happier kind of being an analytical then allowing myself to fully be emotional. And I think this is uh, one of the mechanisms that people, many people, I imagine, uh, try and uh, get themselves into. What, what would I say in the last comment, because I don't want to take up too much time, how people like yourselves can help. And I'm sure there are many, many uh, vehicles. But I'm constantly worried about, uh, on the one hand, the unbelievable assistance of the American government. I mean, I've been following American-Israeli relations for years and years. I, 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 I can't tell you um, how powerful it is to hear American leaders, uh, Republicans and Democrats, relating to Israel as if we're actually genuine partners. Um, we're not living in different parts of the world. And here, little Israel has as a supporter the, these unbelievable politicians in America and England and other parts. And, and this has affected me. That's where I become emotional. When I realize that this little country is no longer being forgotten, known Jewish history where so often we were forgotten, and not too many decades ago, um, and, and, and the feeling now that we are, are not being forgotten. But I, at the same time, I'm so worried by people who think Hamas is just another Palestinian or just another organization. This organization is trying to kill us. And they have killed 1,200 of us and probably many more. And I think, therefore, if I could turn to you um, and and among many of the challenges is I think to try and go out and explain to people, you know, what this is all about. I, I, I'm sorry to be totally political, but this is our Al-Qaeda. This is our 9-11. This is our Pearl Harbor. And to explain to people what's happening isn't an attack on the Palestinians, but it's an attack on an organization which totally wants to destroy us. And this is what I feel and say to myself and force myself to remember just about every day on many, many occasions. Thank you very much. Paul, well, thank you very much for sharing. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Nachliel and then Tomer and then Gila, where we're going also by people need to leave to take care of their families at different points. So. Uh, Nakhliel, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Nakhliel. I'm, uh, uh, when we were just preparing for this meeting, I was actually using my phone because apparently everyone in my area, I live in East Gush Etzion, in a place called Pnei Kedem, and uh, we got a false, uh, it wasn't, there wasn't an alarm, there was just messages saying run into a uh, shelter. And uh, we live in a caravan, so that's not exactly sheltered. And my wife was just putting our four-month-old baby to bed, and we just had to run out of the house. And as we're cramming in there, and I'm on the phone and trying to, you know, set up this meeting, we gotten we were notified that it was a false alarm, uh, that apparently was some kind of error on the Pikuda uh, Oref, the uh, I guess the civilian front. What's the translation for Pikuda Oref? Uh, the home front command. Um, they, it was basically some error in the app, but 
I guess we got uh, practice. Hopefully we won't need it. So that was, uh, that was, I guess, the most serious action I had to take in that regard because it's been pretty quiet here. But it was, uh, it started off, we were here, I mean, Simchat Torah and, and uh, here in Israel, you know, it's just one day. My parents came and stayed by us and about two hours before, um, it, it, two hours before Shabbat was over, uh, I got some news because basically most of my neighborhood are on some sort of security duty, uh, so they're involved. Uh, so like we got some notes and the stuff that I heard, I mean, I'm not going to repeat any anything that I heard, but I was just stunned into disbelief like that. And what I heard was much less than what we know today. And my parents were, everybody's freaking out. They're, cl or they're closing the roads. What's happening? So it hit us. It hit us like that. And we heard some sirens. Um, we heard some stuff in the background. We knew things were going on since the morning. We were told things are happening. Just be on alert. So I'm here. And by the time the uh, Shabbat was out, uh, I'm already seeing like, Toward the last hour of Shabbat, um, most of my my friend here, there's about there's 70 families in the yeshuv. Most of the men have already left. They're already in uniform. They're being called out north south. They're leaving. Now I'm not I'm not I'm, I haven't been uh, recruited. My siblings are both of my brothers are on on either up north or in Gaza, uh, and my brother-in-law is also in an anti-terror unit. So we're we're praying for them. That's my immediate family, and I have lots of first and second cousins I'm very close with. Some of them flew in, they got the notice on Shabbat, they got on a plane and flew into Israel. Um, so we have a lot of family on the line. We know some people who were killed, unfortunately. Uh, it's it's very tragic. But I'm here at home, and um, and with, with, a, with a practically almost a newborn. And uh, so my wife is not able to do anything except take care of him, and that's very important. So I'm like... I'm here, one of the few men uh, who are left in the neighborhood. So what can I do? Uh, and I was thinking, what can I do? How can I contribute? Um, and there's a lot to do here. There are a lot of kids who are home now without school. Uh, there's a lot of uh, families who um, who have a sukkah that's built up. And the winds here are, are, are very, very strong. You have to take your sukkah down. And there's no one, like, who's going to do it? Their, their husbands just got called in. So uh, I got together with another uh, couple, of, another guy, and we just went and helped take down Sukkot one after the other. Uh, there's then I said like, okay, what else can I do? So I offered a lot of free classes. I even you see I'm wearing my uh, this white shirt. This is my uh, Brazilian martial arts capoeira, which is my previous life. I used to teach uh, martial arts. I stopped doing it, changed my career, moved to the states, came back, and here like kids need stuff to do. So I taught a few capoeira classes. I haven't had a chance to change yet. Um, and I've been teaching classes to the teenagers uh, this morning. We did a two-hour class, and I've been doing virtual tours for kids all over the country. I usually charge. I said, like, you know, here's a coupon. Just come in for some. It's just covering some nominal fee. But I've had kids from all over the country join. Uh, and just to maintain consistency, so there's education, so the kids are learning, and so they have stability. That's a very important thing. That's what I've been able to do, uh, and I'm just running around here uh, doing whatever I can. Uh, and so I just tell people, especially if you're local, obviously if you're if you're overseas, there are other ways that you can contribute, and thankfully you, you are. Uh, but locally, it's just to see who needs help in the community. Like people are in chaos. People have uh, anxiety. People need somebody to even just take their kids and help them out a little bit, you know, babysit. So there's so many things that you can do on the home front. Um, and that's pretty much what I've been doing. I haven't left the home the house in almost a week. I've never not left home for that long. So that's been my experience right now. And uh, it's it's very difficult to to compartmentalize because – um, I mean, I, I remember just in, in, in what was it, the 2014, um, you know, my brothers got called in and I wasn't sleeping at night. And now I have a family with, with a kid. So it's it's a completely different ball game. I'm, it's like being with an open nerve all the time, as you know. I'm always worried. My wife was like, she just put the baby to bed and like, okay, we got to run. <laughs> we have a minute and a half to get into a shelter. I mean, it's not, it, it's very different. And now you're thinking about your community and how can, who else needs help? There's some newlyweds, some families that are like just had a baby and the husband's out. It's very difficult. So there's a lot of there's a lot of opportunities to to contribute and to and to be part uh, in other ways. And that's that's what I have to say to people all the time. That's what you can do. Well, thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. Thank you so much, um, Tomil.
Yes, hello, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. For me and my family, the war began when we were in Egypt. We were in Sinai for the Sukkot vacation in very rudimentary hotels, really huts on the beautiful beaches of the Red Sea there. And we heard the news Saturday morning. I mean, there's Wi-Fi. And immediately packed up and, uh, and drove to the border, which was packed with other Israelis coming back or rushing back from vacation. Um, and we drove all the way to Jerusalem, where we live. Um, we live here in Jerusalem, and uh, we, live, we live in Talpiot. Talpiot is a neighborhood uh, which we, perhaps you know is about two kilometers from the Temple Mount, uh, Al-Aqsa. And as, as such, I told my children, we don't have to worry too much about rockets because I don't think with the precision uh, statistics of the very primitive rockets of the Hamas that they will uh, aim here. We have had two sirens so far, and we, we rushed to the shelter of our uh, apartment building. Uh, and, and, and you need to, you have a minute and a half, just like uh, Nahir said, and, and then you, you should stay there like five or 10 minutes. You hear the thuds, like muted muffled thuds, usually of the Patriot missiles, of the counter rockets exploding, and you wait for the more bigger explosion if, if a rocket uh, came through. Uh, and we didn't hear any, but, but there were hits uh, in, in, in very suburban neighborhoods of Jerusalem. Some people were wounded there, but, but really not in our area. And I hope it stays that way. Uh, and, and really what, I mean, what can change that for us perhaps is the intervention of the Hezbollah from the north, for, from, from the Lebanon. That's my primary worry right now, as long as the war is situated in Gaza only and with the Hamas, I don't, I'm not concerned about my personal and my family's safety, but Hezbollah is another matter with a lot more rockets, a lot more precise, and, and perhaps even encouraging um, inner turmoil in Israel between Jews and Arabs, etc. Now I'm. I have a family of four. I mean, I mean, uh, we are four. It's me, my wife, and and, and two boys, young boys. Uh, fortunately, I would say not in not in uh, army service age. My wife has taken upon herself with some other uh, women to organize a group that sets up communities of volunteers that help uh, families that are left behind with their usually male partner off in reserve forces. So that's my, what my wife does morning to evening, phone calls and WhatsApp groups uh, and volunteers to go to people's houses, families that are left without usually their father and help them with food or with entertainment for the kids, uh, et cetera. For me, I'm an academic, I'm a, a, a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute here. And, and frankly, I, I haven't got much work done. Many things were canceled, many, many events were canceled, obviously. And personally, honestly, I, I, I mean, if I, if I have to self-diagnose, I think I'm in a state of shock, really. I can't really work, I can't really write, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm I'm heartbroken, obviously, about what's happened, and um, and full of rage. Uh, so so that's that's my my personal situation, and 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 and, and really and, and and I mean and I would say except for the violence, there's a certain there, there's a certain throwback to COVID days. Two days without school for the kids, uh, with with plans being cancelled, uh, with you and, and and you can't really make other plans because you don't know uh, and what's going to happen. That's and that's basically the feeling. Uh, and again, just the worry of this 
uh, war expanding and, and becoming worse. Um, finally, I would like to say a bit like I think what Paul said that for me, and I know for many others, uh, the unequivocal support we are feeling from the United States is a, an amazing uh, um, like uh, uh, relief. I mean, I think when, when Joe Biden yesterday spoke uh, and, and gave his speech with, with Harris and, and et cetera, and, and uh, by his side, etc. I think you could actually hear a palpable sigh of relief in Israel that, you know, the U.S. has got our back. So, so that's fantastic. And, and if there is something you can do to help, I would say, except for obvious donations, etc., is is you know, write to your Congress member or whatever. I mean the. The, the way the, the, the usual political activity done to, to keep that support uh, resolute and, um, and firm. That's what I would say. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tomer. And just before we go to Gila, I kind of want to say that what you're, because I, I really feel this when I'm listening to each and every one of you, and I want to echo what Tomer said, we're in shock like the ability to share the emotional parts of all the people we know and what's going on with them. It's unavailable right now. So I just, most of the conversations, even among ourselves, sound like this, <laughs> very logistical, very analytical. The moment it moves away from that, we kind of say goodbye and move to text. Um, so I'm assuming that from far away, it feels very strange to hear our voices in this very measured way talking about things like this. Um, but it's kind of how we're keeping things together right now and rather than falling apart. So um, Gila, I, I'm gonna unmute you. I know you're here somewhere. So once you say a word, we'll be able to see you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for joining and for your, all your support. It really means a lot. Um, at the time when the uh, sirens went off on Saturday morning, my parents were here visiting from overseas, the Hagim. And so my immediate concern was for them. And um, I managed to get them out of the country yesterday. And then I immediately went to a friend of mine living in Herzliya, whose husband was pulled up and she has three kids, um, five and under. And so I have since then stopped being glued to the news and become a kindergarten teacher um, for her children. Um, and so that in that sense, I'm helping. I very much did that during Corona. And so I identify with what Tom Air said about feeling like you're in Corona again, because it's only the grocery shops, the pharmacy shops and the essential need shops, which are open. Everything else is shut. And during Corona, I also helped my friends who were doctors babysit. Since obviously all my tour groups have been cancelled and I identify with what Sherelle said about the practicalities because it is absolutely heartbreaking. When I spent a year here between high school and university, I spent six months living on Kibbutz Alumim, which is one of the Kibbutzim in the Otef Aza. And um, I just have to say for all the stories of murder, because they are, it's just, it's, it's murder. It's not killing, it's murder there are equally amount of stories of heroes and the amount of stories of Gura that of individuals that have fought off terrorists and in kibbutz near Am, the whole kibbutz managed to kill off 25 terrorists before they reached the fence. The equal amount of stories of um, murder there is just the stories of Israel coming together with all the volunteering and the country coming together is um, is the one thing I think 
Hamas may have not counted on is the fact that we have uh, unity and that's what's going to make us prevail. That's it. Thank you. In terms of like other help, um, can you still hear me? Um, I have a friend in the army and um, he has asked me to get um, some special Leatherman scissors. I'm going to search the country for them tomorrow and try and get them to them. So specific things I've been donating to soldiers in every supermarket. There's people standing with uh, trolleys to like donate to soldiers as well. And I took everything that I could from my house, gave it to the soldiers and all collection points. And so every little bit counts. And thank you for everything that you do donate. Uh, thanks, Gila. I'll just echo the story she mentioned because it's really heartwarming. The name of the woman who helped Kibbutz Niram fight off all the terrorists is Inba Lieberman. She was the first and only uh, kind of security officer of a kibbutz. I don't know how to say it properly the title uh, in English. She realized what was happening. She alerted everyone. She placed all the men with uh, uh, weapons on the fence. They managed to fight everyone off and they kind of basically saved their kibbutz. And it is uh, a beautiful story uh, amidst all the horrors that we're hearing. Um, I yeah? have one other thing to say, which is that um, I also don't take lightly the fact that this affects all of you as well. Um, because my family in Sydney have personally been exposed to anti-Semitism since this has started, and I know the reverberations of this war felt in your communities as well. Yeah, thank you, Gila. Um, okay, we have uh, David Mendelssohn with us, and then Evgenia, and I'm trying to keep us within the time frame, so uh, I might stop you, but I want us to be able to hear all of you. So, David? Hello, can you all hear me? Hi. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I really appreciated Gila's final comment about um, how it affects others. Um, I'm getting so many uh, uh, messages, emails, calls from uh, former students, from friends who are abroad, family members who are feeling so helpless and uh, shocked, and just as um, and just as uh, traumatized in many ways as we are for, for this uh, horrific attack. So um, I uh, I think that uh, that has to be acknowledged. Um, for for uh, my perspective, I spent the uh, the the first uh, until today basically. I was I was in Jerusalem, and where we live in Alman Hanatziv is uh, directly by uh, many Arab communities. And um, given my work for the past uh, you know few decades in the Arab sector, it was very uh, strange to uh, both be sent, an alarm would send us to the shelter with where I'd be with my wife and my two children and uh, and then come out and hear the people in the neighboring uh, villages celebrating this attack. You'd hear Iron, Iron Dome come uh, come overhead sometimes and uh, take care of the rocket. Um, and uh, it was very, it was very surreal. And um, my daughters, uh, none of us, very few of us know anybody who wasn't impacted. My daughter's uh, best friend survived that uh, that that rave that rave party that killed so many people. She actually documented it herself, running with everybody else where she hid. And so uh, we have people that we know that are missing. So um, it's just impacted the entire country in a very very personal way. And um, the uh, and again because of my work in the Arab sector, I'm hearing from many of my uh, Arab friends both. Uh, Israeli, uh, Arab, Palestinian, Israeli, and Palestinian who are checking in uh, to make sure that I'm okay, but also feel uh, uh, very worried about what's happening to people in Gaza. So it, it adds an extra dimension to uh, to um, to our to our story. The um, uh, the other aspect that's that I think a lot of us I heard are dealing with. That some, some of you spoke about this is we have family who are who are from abroad who are visiting. And getting them home and having all the flights being closed off and that's that sense of panic for people that feel that they can't leave 
um, and then trying to reassure people that have never experienced anything like this before. And, uh, and you can't really reassure them, even though some of us unfortunately have lived through, <clears throat> have lived through other rocket attacks and, uh, and experience that you can't tell them this is normal, but, uh, you do try and give them some sense, some sense of assurance and, uh, that this is going to pass, that Israel will, will survive and that we're, we're resilient. And, um, and, and my family has noticed that, that people are coming together like never before. And, uh, I have an aunt who rather, uh, um, sardonically remarked that she misses war because every time it happens, you see how wonderful the people of Israel actually are and how they take care of each other. So um, it's uh, it's really sad and unfortunate that you see that aspect, that wonderful aspect. Um, um, again, re reoccurring everywhere you look, food drives being organized, blood drives being organized, people helping each other everywhere you look. So uh, yeah, and um, for my 16 year old son who's never experienced anything like this, it's very traumatizing. And uh, my four-year-old, uh, Alon, doesn't even know what's going on. He just enjoys sitting, sitting with us in the shelter. Everything is a big game. And my wife is, uh, is also very, of course, um, uh, very uh, alarmed and worried about her family. So we're just, uh, this is what we're dealing with. And um, I'll uh, leave it at that for now. Thank you, David. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, Evgenia, and then I'm going to close with a few remarks and tell you about the initiatives and share some links um, and all of that. So, Evgenia, if you can unmute yourself. Yes. Thank you, Shira. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Arya, for inviting me here. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, I live in Haifa, so we are in a, until now, we're in a safe area. We just experienced our first siren in my life uh, about an hour, an hour ago. We were, uh, out, we were not at home we, we, with my daughter. We were driving in the car up in um, upper town. And so we just spoke with her. We just, I have a eight and a half year old daughter. So we just discussed in the car what we were supposed to do in case of a siren. And exactly that moment, it, it just happened. So. We did what we had we were supposed to do, stop the car, jump out of it, run away, found a shelter, waited there. My daughter just finished reading Harry Potter. So for her, Harry Potter is really good way to explain things and explain terrorists, because it's very much what this book is about, the absolute evil that just is willing to murder. That's it. Uh, we were both frightened, I have to tell you. Uh, it's no fun. And then uh, we're safely home. As soon as the war began, I brought my mom and my sister to our apartment because we have shelter right in the apartment. I'm actually sitting in it right now. Uh, when the war broke out in the morning, first my dad called me and uh, I realized I have a close friend who lives in um, in kibbutz near him, near Aza, with her husband and her nine-year-old daughter. So I texted her. They were in the bomb shelter in her in their home, and during the day we were in constant co contact with each other. Our kids played computer game online, and then after six p.m. she stopped responding. And I started searching news, but there was no, nothing about what was going on in, in particular settlements in the South. So that night was very difficult for me emotionally because I couldn't get any information of what was going on with my friend. And then in the morning, she came back to me. She said that they had no connection, so they could not call. They could not text. Um, they're safe. They have been rescued. They've been evacuated to a lot. Uh, my husband is a psychotherapist, therapist, so he started helping um, former hostages, those who were evacuated from the South, talking to them, helping them going through that trauma. Um, emotionally, for me, it's a very difficult time. It's easier when I'm busy, when I'm doing something, either I prepare some some future talks because all current lectures have been canceled or I help somebody or I take care of the family or I walk my daughter because she, with some of her friends and take care of them. But morning and evening are very difficult because it's like, it's hard not to 
listen to the news, not to read them, not to go through them emotionally. It's very hard to, uh, to hear from the people, from my friends who live abroad and from my sister who is in Harvard now, from some other friends of mine that all around the world, uh, there is so much anti-Israeli propaganda as usual. It's really, for me as an Israeli, it's very, very, one of the most difficult emotional things. And that's why the support that we see now, that's exactly what Paul was speaking about, I think is one of the most important things. So if I could have asked any Jew living outside of Israel, I would have said, uh, please do whatever you can to explain uh, the maximum number of people that what's going on here, it's not just another conflict. It's not a territorial conflict. It's not a normal war. It's actually a story about people coming to us murdering us uh, with just one purpose to murder and nothing else and it's and it's not it's it's not just another conflict somewhere in the middle east and i think from from my personal perspective that's one of the most important things that anybody anybody can do is just to to, to support us I, any any way possible and and especially um like from this informational uh um with this inf important information. And so it's it's valuable and important that you were here now and thank you very, very much for it. Thank you, Evgenia. Um, we're gonna go just a few minutes overboard, but we're gonna try and end this on time. And I really wanna thank uh, all of you who are here who came to listen and came to share. Um, it's really a very strange feeling. I also, it's like, I, I feel none of us are talking directly about what we're experiencing, but I don't feel I'm able to either. So we'll leave it in at that. Um, and I wanna explain a little about the donations that we're doing. And I'll say, first of all, this, cause I've been having also people sending me in the chat, a lot of organizations to, um, that are in need. And I do want to say they are all valid, whether you're giving to Magenda Vida Dom or you're giving to the IDF or you're giving to Naamat or you're giving to a hospital, they are all 100% valid and so much is needed. Um, what we created was, um, it's a donation line, I'll put the link in the chat where uh, we were looking, because as Israelis, what we've been doing, we've been donating each kibbutz, I'll explain it like this. Each kibbutz has one bank account because the monies are shared, okay? So you're hearing about kibbutzim, Nir Oz, Kfar Aza, Beri. They each have a bank account because their accounts are shared. So what we've been doing is donating directly into their bank accounts because the families who managed to escape left with nothing. I literally got emails of like not having shoes for her two-year-old and not having any warm clothes for anyone. So what we're doing other than sending these supplies is also putting as much money as possible because the journey these people are going to have to go through is going to be very long. And so we created this donation line we are, and when I say we, I, um, I'm being immensely helped by a ton of people, but mainly by a woman named Dana Yoeli. She's also an artist and an activist. Her um, and her husband's family, um, some of their family have been. And uh, we, we came together with the kibbutz movement. It's like an umbrella organization of all the kibbutzim. They agreed that with the way we do it, they will take all donations and just transfer them directly to the kibbutzim. They're not taking any money from it. They're not holding it. It's going to go directly. The big advantage is also that each kibbutz is in a different financial situation. So some kibbutzim are very rich. They have the finances to take them over and some really don't have, so it's distributed according to need, okay, and not necessarily in equal amounts. Uh, the kibbutz movement doesn't have a US uh, branch, a friends of, but they do have um, 
a sub-organization called Giv'at Chaviva, which is usually dedicated for programs of shared life between Jews and Arabs. And they agreed to give over their platform for us to collect the donation monies Again, not take anything from themselves. They're putting their people to do this, their platform, their time, everything, to transfer the money from their bank account directly to the kibbutz movement that will then immediately give it to the people. So a lot of this is also about being direct and immediate with no stops on the way. Um, um, and so uh, I'm putting here in the uh chat the link and we will send also obviously a newsletter with all the information uh this is the direct link to donation um and really the amount of people who worked on this volunteering people from wix website platform to allow this to happen people writing accountants and lawyers making sure this is all working for you as citizens and very very clear um I do want to say again, any way you choose to donate your time, your money, your thoughts, your prayers, and in whatever direction is right for you, they're all valid. Um, this is just another way that I felt was missing and much, much needed. So much so that I've been getting phone calls from people here asking when, um, uh, when this link will be live so that they can give. Um, there were many questions and comments in the chat. Um, we're not going to answer them now so that we keep within the time frame. I will look at them and respond personally to, to what I can. Um, and we will also, again, share a newsletter so that you can spread the word. Um, I personally let the families I know who uh, managed to survive that the link is now live and that there is more help and many, many people that want to support. Um, uh, Wendy, do you want to add anything before we close? Yes, just on behalf, I know of everybody here, I want to just thank from the bottom of my heart, everyone who shared today. Um, We're here to support you. Our hearts are with you in Israel for you, your families, and for all the people of Israel. Um, I also want to let our know our our fund holders know that the foundation is expediting all gifts to Israel. So we have doubled our check processing, and we are actually even looking into wiring out very rapidly directly to the nonprofits, so that the people who need it the most can get these gifts as quickly as possible. And I, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, and we will we will be sending out an email shortly with all of the information about the nonprofit today that uh, Sherelle has discussed, as well as some other giving options. Um, okay, so um, the link is again in the chat. If you want to copy it and just send it around, there is also uh, it, once you go to that link, if you scroll beyond the form, there's a complete detail of how it's working financially and what the donation is going towards so it's very very easy to follow the money which uh i think is also uh important um thank you i hope i don't know what i hope for at this point thank you and um uh, yeah, may we know better days than this. We'll see you. Thank you.